It's a very special episode of The Appreciator, right here, right now. Let's listen together. Here with Q and Twyla once again. Um, we're going to have a track from their uh, upcoming, a, a kind of a preview mix of their upcoming album, Don Juan's Bench. And uh, I've got this bunch of questions that I'm asking artists and musicians, but I figured that I'd run them by you guys and see... Uh, it? Well, does anybody want to know why the title Don Juan's Bench? I mean, that's a very uh, esoteric title. Mm -hmm. Twyla, why is it called Don Juan's Bench? Well, we were in Tula, Hidalgo, Mexico, and we went through the um, how should I say, search mm -hmm. for the Don Juan's bench, and we found it. A Don through Juan it. being being the Ayaki, uh, 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 Tolteca sorcerer, and he had a particular bench that he'd always sit on, and the author Carlos Castaneda would meet him at this bench. So the bench was developed into a type of power spot. And we found an elder who was a child uh -huh. at the time that Don Juan was still alive. And uh, so it's a it's a it's a, the real bench. Wow. Now there they do there are a few Don Juan benches in different places. There's one by the church, there's one in Oaxaca, mm -hmm. in the different nodes that he visited. This one is in Tula, El Centro. So El Centro meaning the central square where everybody congregates. Kind of like the plaza, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. You know, the mall where all the shops are on. But <clears throat> as, we, as we sat in it during the day, we realized it was positioned perfectly to watch the setting sun. And the next thing we noticed during the day was this large tree right behind the bench. And then the third thing was that it was very rare that people were actually sitting in that bench. Except after we did what we did, which is uh, had our experience, we sat there actually in the second attention. Mm -hmm. We went there at night. And you know? I, I really didn't think that I would have any contact with Don Juan, but I, I figured it's a power spot and I'll try for it. And I called for his name and... Sure enough, we had an experience. Oh, wow. And after have that experience is actually described in the lyrics oh, to the Don Juan Bench song. Oh, nice. The whole song is about that. Now, and I was sitting next to Twyla on the same bench, and I thought she was gone forever. She was in complete internal silence, no internal dialogue, and her eyes were closed, and I knew that she was in a completely different world. So I, I sat there calmly until she returned to tell me that she had, in fact, met Don Juan. So I said, well, okay, I'm going to try now. And the same effect for me was, and whether with eyes open or closed, there was, there's a bench on the opposite side of the walkway, and there was Don Juan saying to me, you are my mirror reflection. You are Don Juan. And we are now reflecting one another bench to bench. At what point a, a kind of a pyramidal luminous field developed over him on the other side of the bench. Now for me it was more about sitting and all of a sudden realizing that he was his energy double was inside me in the same exact replica position that I was. It's mm -hmm. like my position was his position, and that's when everything stopped. And I don't think I've ever, in all my meditations, so to speak, mm. have been able to reach that kind of silence. So that's the... Uh, and then when we were done with all of that, we all of a sudden looked at each other and we're going, that's our next album. And we went to pictures. And yeah, I saw the cover, and it's a picture of the actual bench. Ben, on the yeah, cover the actual of the bench. Album. And um, to go back to the beginning mm -hmm. of the story, right. after that experience, 
we couldn't sit on that bench anymore. Every time we got there, somebody would be sitting there. It was active. <laughs> yes, of course. But you had to return first. No, but before that, seriously, every time we showed up, just no, like in the books, yeah. Donald shows up and the bench is always available for him. Uh, but it changed after the experience, which was yeah. very interesting. Uh, well, I think both of our experiences were about becoming Don Juan or having Don Juan be our persona. So that energy field from the other side to this side, you dissolve your, your personal ego and you become the other person. I think Don Juan was becoming us. And that sort of sorcery exchange means that you have to leave your internal dialogue. Yeah. So naturally, this whole album is about, you know, encounters with the other side. Um, and this was a sort of like the key joint, the portal. Well, being like our, our, our 23rd or 24th album, the fact that we come to TRC to do our recording now and wonder each time, because we're not preparing a song for a song, we're just going to face the instruments after a year's break and enter into the unknown. And the possibilities have to be um, our, our collected experience over the past year. So as we become elevated to a new level of sorcery, that controls what the music is, what the sounds will be. So we don't know. It's not like practicing on an instrument. It's really becoming the new people we are, and we're exhibiting our new people down through the sounds of the past year. Uh -huh. And for some reason, I don't know how that reflects who we are exactly, but this album is about maximalism. Yeah. I mean, maximum input uh, from noise music to uh, uh, you know, rock and roll guitars to, you know, all forms of vocalizing, mm -hmm. maximalism. She's using a more so, heavy uh, atmosphere, heavier drum beat, heavier. She wants the sound of white noise behind most of the compositions. So I think that atmosphere is becoming not only maximum, but uh, very dense. Intense. And intense. If you look at our, our album, first album in, in 2000, mm -hmm. we were very uh, sparse, almost uh, influenced by hip hop, uh -huh. where there's a, there's a minimum sound and, and then the rest are kind of a, a rap, and that was combined with her Middle Eastern uh, training, and uh, she was studying Indian vocalizing, so we start very uh, minimalist, mm -hmm. and have been slowly working up to maximalist. Yeah. Right, and then, you know, there is that concept or, or idea of reality as uh, being seen as levels of intensity. So in that respect, it's so intense that we're saying intensity is awareness. And also from the perspective of flooding the information gates brings one to silence. It's the opposite of silent meditation. Right. And it's like when you have maximum input, the brain just can't Shuts deal with it and, and it goes it's into the same effect. Right. It goes in it's the opposite side of uh, silent meditation. Also Twyla, but you receive the same Twyla discovered also she said, wait, I can't sing in the high registers anymore because my voice has changed so radically. But all of a sudden I'm listening to the mixes, and she does all the uh, composing uh -huh. of, of the input that I'm you know, offering the instruments. Why is your voice so high? What do you she goes, oh, these are samples from when I first started singing you know, 24 years ago. Right, I've included, I was inspired to include some of the work I did with another person, which, interestingly enough, I don't even have their name. Huh. So it's going to be an unknown contributor um, but I, I went ahead and created a, you know, a, so to, to speak, album from my collaboration with that person. So I took a couple um, sessions from that and integrated it 
into our work. Yeah, here. which is really fascinating because you're spanning 24 years mm -hmm. of the changing of a voice and not trying to disguise it with um, auto tune or anything. That's so that life experience again gets, is what combined. makes the artist. The artist, whether you're a painter or a musician, if they're trying to disguise their life experience, then you have a fake presentation. So if, uh, let's say that Johnny Cash is now known for doing uh, the uh, Nine Inch Nails song, Hurt, because his voice is so damaged and hurt just before he dies right. that everyone says, well, that's more life-like. Or we can contrast that with, you know, um, his early work like Ring of Fire when his voice was higher. Yeah. But the depth in Hurt kind of affects people a lot more than Ring of Fire. Yeah, well, it, and it's also more from the core than his life. the throat. Yeah, well, yeah That absolutely. brings you yeah. <clears throat> something that I seen just recently at an art show. I saw a, a painting that included some Native Indian elders mm -hmm. photos, and I was like, it just dawned on me that everything we see about the, the Native culture is a... a, a a huge percentage of it is the elders, not so much the young people. So they um, saw the elders as the ones to present as their representatives because the elders had all the knowledge. Right. And they lived in nature, so they became more and more luminous and not less and less luminous. So something like that in the music, right? And then, well, the well, we've been talking a lot about, the elder. Uh, about death and seeing death in the core of everything. As we moved up these 24 years of seeing, now our albums, the one before this was Death as an Advisor, right? Now we're at Don Juan's Bench, which is actually on the other side of death. And that we're seeing that in our life experience with friends and people who are now elders, they're dying. And if yep. they're not dying, they look like they're dying. Or they're well on their way, yeah. Uh, we're into, all of us are entering that phase. Well, not the sorcerers, let's be no. clear about this. What is really interesting, we heard at the beginning of our path in uh -huh. Tolteca that we were going to see everyone around us perish. Of course, we wondered, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. That really means the sorcerer is taking on energy as a black hole as a void, instead of reflecting so much like a sun, they're absorbing the energy. But what we find is we can't be around dying people all the time because they are taking from the source, which is us. So in order for us to continue our vitality and energetic field, as Twyla said today, what'd you say about interact with people? You said, I'm not going to hug people anymore. Well, I, 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 I do find myself, as I age, mm -hmm. to become more and more and more sensitive. I think my eyes see more, yeah. and uh, seeing, also feeling is part of seeing. So right. I feel more, and the sensitivity, you know, is, is almost like, it's, it's becoming immense. I can't, literally, I can't eat food in most restaurants. I can't, um, everything like that I see, uh, you know, little clues that I get about people, I it's almost like too much for me. I have to be less um, involving of my luminous ball with other people's luminous ball. So I hugging mean, becomes a, a difficult thing. I mean, right? literally even just sitting with people, I'm aware that their luminosity is becoming part of my luminosity, right. and so, let alone hugging, my God. <laughs> so, you know, anyways, that's part of the uh, match, you know, maturation. Well, the also, we were told a long time ago that the, as the rest of the world begins to descend, meaning not as aware, or the parasite flyers okay. emphasizing fear and greed and everyone happening, that the sources will be rising to the fifth dimension as opposed to everybody else who's descending to the second dimension. This causes even a greater separation 
in how we can interact with people because there was at one time a overlap when we weren't in the fifth dimension and, and they weren't in the second. So we were all somewhere in the third dimension and we could actually pretend together. The pretending is becoming very, very thin now, so much thinner than it was even a few years ago. But we used to have large scale events mm. where we'd have like thousands of people who we were interacting with and trying to help with their music or with their, their art. And now but, finding those people is only in Mexico. They don't even exist in the United States anymore. And apprentices were plunged into complete forgetting. They can drive by our building now and not even remember 10 years of work inside one of our the, nodes. When, when yeah. he talks about the fifth and the second dimension, I think most of us, I'd say from the 60s and all the way to 2000, pretty much we were in the third dimension together. We were mm -hmm. like in a 3D reality. But, you know, the computers that have been taking over for, to such a degree that most people now are involved with a screen for most of their life. Mm -hmm. uh, from children looking at the iPhone all the time, from art being made on the computer, uh, all of it is two-dimensional. Even art created, printed 3D, it doesn't vibrate. We have, you know, taken upon ourselves the art of seeing. And when you study seeing and when you see, you see energy as it flows, you see vibration. Those things do not vibrate. That's what we call 2D. Okay, so most of the world is now has descended into a 2D world, while seers, mystics who involve themselves, or sorcerers like us, uh, who involve themselves with seeing energy and living energy, are moving to the fifth dimension where you actually are starting to be aware of beings from other dimensions. So the disparity is like so intense. It's intense. We even have, uh, we even have visitors who come to us and want to talk about beings that they're interacting with, but their conversational presentation is not uh, poetic enough and is not timed perfectly that it's also taking our energy. So even if people come that you think are aligned with you, their presentation is not artistic enough to actually be heard from our perspective and, and, and we're ready to leave. Well, then... I think Carlos Castaneda said it the best. He goes, I don't go out even to uh, the cafes anymore. Because every time I sit down, somebody shows up and tells me their dream. And I have to sit there knowing that they're always going to be at the center of their dream. They're either going to be Cleopatra, Napoleon, or some other historical figure with maximum power, and you know that their dream is therefore an illusion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what is the chance that people have energy-generating dreams, which are true visits to other worlds? Wow, I don't know. That's... We, we search constantly for those people. When you're in Mexico, particularly uh, at the location of Don Juan's bench, mm -hmm. and we venture out to the playa and places where the tourists are, but there's no energetic field there. Uh -huh. In Tula, when we have coffee with the policia there, they say this area has a dome of protection. It's the only one in Mexico where the police are not assaulted, where they don't have to watch their back. This is still the spiritual beginning of Mexico with the Tolteca being part of the necessary royalty of the Azteca and the later Mexica. But the area still has so much power that when they tried to put a Walmart there uh -huh. recently, there was a whole underground city discovered. Hmm. Walmart was extracted by the power of the foundations and all the artifacts that are there. Saving all the... Uh yeah. You know, city streets with all the little stores. Right, and saving all that. And, and merchants. Exactly, and exactly. I, I tell you, that place, uh, it's refreshing how people in Mexico do believe in magic. And when people believe in magic, there is magic. Right. Because it just, it, the, the synapses are all connected.
Yeah, well, for it's a magic consensus to happen. reality, right? You know, omens show up, agreements show up, people show up in certain spots at certain times. You find people magically. Um, a weekend there is Unfortunately, Castle Park. here, yeah. uh, people do not believe in magic. We came back as a re regresso of Kessel Quark. We're coming back to Tula after thousands of years being gone because we promised that we would come back right. to built in Kessel Quark. So I asked to build in Kessel Quark, go down the street, announce my presence, and all of a sudden, somebody who was supposed to be a chef starts cooking again. All of a sudden, if they're not opening up the pyramid grounds, Twyla starts a fire with her intention that eliminates all of the bureaucracy that was preventing that from remaining a spiritual location. All of a sudden, everybody's going down there now. Wait a minute. They came back and they tried really hard to actually purchase a small property or apartment mm -hmm. so that they would be sure to return every time, and we did not help them. We failed again. That's the discussions going on down mm -hmm. in Tula, is the fact that we again had the opportunity, mm -hmm. and they gave us two chances, uh -huh. and very few of us, and there are people down there that are you know, really aligned with us, but the vast majority of people had the opportunity to assist more, mm -hmm. and once again, they, they did not do that. Right. So, you know, we have our apprentice down there. We gave him his new Nawal woman, which was the end of our tonal work with the right. apprentice. After we've shown him stalking and dreaming and power spots and allies and everything yeah. necessary, the final act for us is to begin his core of sorcerers, his young man in his mid-20s, huh. is to present him with his Nawal woman, which we did, in yeah, a we ceremony. discussed that on the last tech. Exactly. And now they have their combined energy and they have a benefactor in Don Arturo who will help with the formal training that is necessary. But Quetzalcoatl and Twyla have done their spirit side mm -hmm. activation. The next phase for us, and we talk about it a lot, is how do we... we, we we've done the cores of... of Apprentices, we, you know, we've done all the arts of sound and vision. We have now, if there's a template of Quetzalcoatl, he began wandering mm -hmm. all around to activate and leave gifts. He left Tula to Pilsen and went to other parts where he interacted. Particularly, there's a tree where he did certain sculptures in before he left on his serpent skin uh, raft, pledging to return. So now that he's returned, mm -hmm. is he wandering again throughout sites in the world, interacting with people to activate them? To some degree, that happens when we, when we go out and people go, uh, wow, you just gave us hope. Yeah. You, we're descending into the second dimension and you presented the possibility that we will be rising and rebuilding civilization again. Maybe that is part of this album. Maybe the arts that we have done for people to stay and, and be in our magical spaces is part of that. Maybe the Sex Dreaming book by Vega is part of our gifts that are going to create this new understanding of this landscape and the civilization that was here first. I like with this uh, album as a, a gift to the people is to uh, stress the point of listening with the headphones with the idea of taking a journey, not so much the idea of putting a song on and starting to dance. It's right. more about, um, you know, going into a, an unknown place with sound. Uh -huh. um, there is the idea in the songs of some form of bridge, some form of... Um, you're listening to a melody or a, or a sentence that you understand, but most of it is a journey into the unknown, and um, I think headphones would be very appropriate for this album. And which is a vehicle for many people now with the earbuds and all the technology. When you're working or when you're doing things, you can be doing, which is a real sorcery act now, 
out on your job site, you can actually be doing two things at once, right? <laughs> you know, and doing two things at once splits your attention, which is part of sorcery, to practice being in your energy double, which would be in the dreamscape of the music and doing your plumbing at the same time. Wow, I don't know if I can achieve that. <laughs> Not with this music. <laughs> you might get a little, a little bit too on the I think on I'm, the dream too, side. I'm too, you know, I know the music so well, but I don't know if I can detach like that. But, um, anyway, no, no, we uh, should move on also to... Yeah, let's see what his questions are. What's oh, I'm right, sorry. Yes, but yes, what, yes. what did you want to move on? No, no, no go ahead. Go. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll ask you first. What was the few, first music that excited you as a kid? Wow, my brother's playing the guitar. And, uh, well, I happened to grow up in the 60s, so uh -huh. a lot of cover songs of, uh, you know, 60s hits. Uh, just loved it. And then uh, we, in back in Israel, we had one uh, uh, singer-songwriter that was kind of like... The star of the of the sixties and seventies in Israel, and we would just await his albums. I guess his was a big influence as well. He was a little bit intellectual. What was his name? Mati Kaspi. Oh, okay. And your first, like the first thing when you were a kid oh. that you heard, oh, you the said, Kingston, oh. the Kingston Trio. Yeah. And so all of their albums, being the folk era, this was in. Uh, prior like that to the Hootenanny era. Yeah, the Hootenanny yeah. thing, but but not the uh, Pete Seeger. Uh, what, yeah, not those Seeger. commies. Yeah, not those commies who are doing the, the real folk music. No, no. I was interested in the Brothers Four, you know, the, the, the Kingston Trio, the, uh, what can I say, the, the smooth uh, Yeah, the structure. Brothers Four, really. I had those records as a kid, too, and you don't hear them anymore. Michael rode the boat ashore. That was one of their hits. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, hearing those and then being actually in grammar school mm -hmm. and my mother is saying, ah, you should play the accordion. I said, mom, it's the guitar. And somehow I knew that that was the way. And finding a fellow uh, person who would play the banjo uh -huh. and we could start imitating the Kingston Trio with our striped shirts and everything, which oh, of course yeah. eventually led standard thing. <laughs> to uh, the Ted Mac Amateur Hour. Right, the, the, the bucket yeah. five, three. Bucket three. three, no, it's yes. three, yeah. Right. They went through various members, but some of them had to go to Vietnam and they joined the military, but yeah, the bucket three. Yeah, yeah and Israel had all these like mainstream 60s, like Mary Mary Hopkins, those were the days. Yeah, okay. I just mm. love that so much, and, um, you know. Okay, next like question, that. what do we got? Uh, where would you say you were from? Where I was from? Where would you say you were from? Oh, well, um, I do think that my uh, that I'm an incarnation probably from a Mayan, uh, hmm. Mayan lineage, absolutely. And you? Which other people see, I'm going to they always say, are you Mayan, even in uh, Mexico? They always ask me if I'm from Argentina <laughs> yeah, or... Some some Mesoamerican or South American country, country. Yeah. 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 Uh where what was the question again? Where, where would you say you are from? Oh, I am absolutely from a inner dimensional, clear, transparent spacecraft, which however does have an easel, and I am painting all the time in that transparent vehicle. Twyla, when did you write your first song? Wow, uh, I think for all orange. Really, I mean, I don't know. I, well, I don't know if I wrote songs. That's the thing. That's why I'm getting a little uh, hesitant on the answer because uh, when I started in my music uh, explorations, I would just jam with all kinds of musicians and so I was just improvising most of the time and recording that's when I started recording is almost right from the beginning uh, improvising improvisation and recording so when we got together by the time we got together I was pretty proficient at improvisation so 
he would start playing and I would just sing. And the so most amazing so songs will just thing. happen right on the spot. And when did you uh, write your first song? Oh, oh, so I was in the folk genre and I began to realize that imitating the cover songs of the Kingston Creo was not making the leap. We didn't have any mentorship, so nobody in our community said, hey, why don't you pick up the electric guitar and become the Jefferson Airplane? Mm -hmm. So I was stumbling with the input of the Beatles, abstract compositions, and folk music, but every Every night, I would sit down to my Concord reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and write a song every single night. And that continued with a portable deck that I had when I went to L.A. at 18. So I began writing, and it was a, it was a religious uh, <coughs> process like meditation that, although I was doing visual art, I had to compose songs every day. That was part of my discipline. Huh. So there's one that the banjo player, Bucket 3, just said, I have old tapes of some of your experimental songs, like Me and My Dog, Out the Rest Home, A Spider Weaving Webs. He knows oh, you all the words get those. and all the chords. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, you have, so you have your own historian. Uh, did, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Who is your biggest inspiration? For music? Just biggest inspiration. It could be music, it could be... Well, I think J.Q. here. Yeah. yeah, that makes and sense. And Don Juan, Carlos Castaneda. And... I, I would agree in, entirely. <clears throat> the only books that affected me uh, as I began to read were the Carlos Castaneda books. Uh, I literally and, can't stop reading them. And, and we consider him the greatest artist in all genres of the 21st century. So his influence in our sound and vision led us to Tula, for example, to Don Juan's match. Well, that, that kind of sort of uh, answers the next question, but I'll ask it anyways. What do you see as your trajectory? Trajectory? Uh, could you explain a little bit? To, where are you going? Where am I going? Oh. Well, I don't know if I'm going there, but I'm intending mm -hmm. more and more sorcery dreams, visiting other worlds, and being able to map the second attention for other sorcerers. That's that's the thing that I like to do best. I like to do it through writing, but I also, or dreaming, and also through music. So this album presents some of the journey into other worlds that we are presenting. And your trajectory? As to Pilsen, Council Quat now, having been dormant and on the other side for hundreds of years, and now coming back through this Nawal body, everything seems to be relatively uh, new, but also unenergetic. There's no real people, there's no real music, there's no real art, there's no real literature. There is everything that needs to be rebuilt. My trajectory is, and again, as to Pilsen, being a figure that was a ruler is to rule over a vast tract of land that is confined, what we call our blue diamond, within our four nodes of perception that we have created in the four directions. And I am always looking for what is that going to look like? Do we have the Mad Max end of the world? And and I'm writing some uh, car put together with scrap pieces of metal. I don't know yet, but I know that our influence, again, through our you know, beginning, through our art and music, uh, conversations like this on the internet, and having the four nodes ready and all the people we've activated, this is already setting the template for 
the controlling over this vast tract of land when the descent of the world is finally complete? I think we desperately need, as a, a civilization, a council of wise men that's not connected with politics. That would be nice. Uh, people who are uh, men and women of knowledge. And who's to define that, right? Uh, that would make decisions about art and about uh, what to promote, what not to promote, and to start, uh, how should we say, judging again? Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say judging, I would say uh, uh, discerning. Curating. Curating. And, and just like they curate in museums, but even the museums should be under the influence or the decision-making of the Council of Wise Men. And the question is, who gets yeah, who put the together wise men, right. the Council of Wise Men and, and, and it's women? A, and it's a difficult position because most wise people would never be in a council. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. but I would so say this that is a new is a new is a new thing from again that fifth mm -hmm. dimension. Yeah, position. they would be in the fifth We're dimension. Actually, our, our experience they would see energy, right? But our, our right? experience has been that our influence is not by using our reason that we're going to be in charge of this large tract of land. Things happen simply because our will to do impeccable best causes reproductions that we could never have thought of. For example, we started Telemagic Art and Music Festival in a remote location that was decimated and very dark. And now, thousands of acres have been preserved for vision quests due to our seeing of the possibilities of And our of cleaning that land. of the land. And then, and then the new owners have come in to the spa and they're working for us, although we never hired them. Right. They came in with art and music and but spirit they're as their intention. Our intention. Right. Over at the at the on the other side of the freeway, it's the same thing. So that intention here in Hack is also percolating. People are coming to us and saying, "How can we do a gathering here? This will be the new Jerusalem. The the space that you've created is a nucleus of an event. Mm -hmm. It is not for people to stay. It is a, an experience, an event that moves the assemblage point." We had no idea uh, when Twyla was arranging the art that it would have that impact. It wasn't our reason, it was our impeccable behavior that causes the ripple extending out like a stone thrown in the water. Nice. And it's important for people to uh, learn to see energy because they, they cannot really, today in our confusing world, people cannot distinguish good art from, from bad art. Yeah. And the only way to see that really is not by uh, looking at the fashion of the time or the patterns that people set up to say this is right, this is wrong, or everything is good, or everything is okay, or we're all equal. All that is uh, really, it's like, let's just throw that out and let's look at the energy that, that is emanating from everything. If we're able to see that energy is emanating and we're able to see it, then we can distinguish good art from bad art. Well, we've also found, my benefactor Kacharo said many, many years ago, that we're not working from the top down. So now the elders are not telling the young apprentices what to do. We're asking the young people, what do they see that we should do? Now, finding those young people are that intended is our job through seeing, to see their energetic yeah. form. But once we find them, then we say, what do we do now? Except, you know, it, it is a, a little bit um, dangerous at this time because most of the young kids are inside screens. Yeah. yeah. How do you retrain Well, you brought them out, our young apprentice in Mexico. He started off, he was showing us all of his paintings done on a tablet. Mm -hmm. And Twyla goes, throw that, what is, what is that? Throw that away. I want you to use real paint real and pencil. real canvas and real he pencil. He started with a pencil, right? <laughs> yep. yeah. And yeah. now he just loves that. He, yeah, he's not, not even doing anything. Escaping that digital this world is so important. This whole AI thing is, is horrendous to us. The things that AI can do uh, is 
It's like dazzling. Yeah, but, but it has not, no substance. There's no energy to it. Exactly. And same with like the music, how it distorts music from the past. That is sad. When I take music, really great music from the past, and they insert it into like disco or... It's just like... Well, it's, it's constantly been the battle between the robot and the human, between the organic and the inorganic. Right. That, that's from John Henry days, right? Steel yeah. drive a man. Am I going to beat the machine at putting the, you know, um, the, the, uh, spikes the in, in, yeah. into the rail? And of course, he's going to lose. So don't even bring the machine in in, in the first place, right? Yeah. And I mean, we use the machine a lot. I mean, yeah, but our... you use it as a tool. You don't let it use you, and you don't compete with it. Right, but right. how do you teach Correct. that again? The right. council of wise men, yeah, and women. You'd say wise men and women. Wise people, yep. yes. <laughs> and let's see, uh, who would you like to open for? <laughs> That's a very. It's a very good question because I was just having that dream the other the other night um Halo. about that I would I think, open for yeah Halo. i think that's a really good choice Halong is a norwegian group who only use traditional uh viking instruments uh pieces of steel and you know uh, skin drums and and chanting and they do a whole theatrical production because all orange was using all those techniques, right? primal instruments that we made ourselves, projection, and atmosphere of magic. So I think that that would be a, a appropriate. Yeah. I mean, I, I was looking for the new Beatles, and, I, and I'm like, sometimes I think they are, not that they are doing anything close to what the Beatles are doing, but that they're taking they're this having that. sort of like position of changing the face of, of music into a whole other realm, which in actuality is very ancient. They're going back to nature. Nice. So they're going back to the art of energy. Here's a good one for you guys. What's your dream venue? Hmm. Probably Space you know, Castle. We, 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 we kind of did that, you know, in creating a festival. You where we built were your permanently own. set up. It's, sorcerers have to create all the worlds themselves. Right. They actually, if, for example, if you go to a, a, a curator museum and, and say, uh, in a traditional way, can you exhibit my work? They're going to go, well, your work may be good, but wait a minute, you are the work. You have to stand in the middle of the gallery. Okay, so I have to create now my own museum. So we go ahead and we create five of our own museums. Right. Go to a festival and you audition, they're gonna go, wait a minute, what is this? It doesn't sound like a, a DJ uh, thing. So we have to create our own festival. And in creating our own festival, we have to create our own stage, which permanently has all of our lighting, film projections, everything set up. Yeah, I would go back to that. However, yeah. since we're yeah. not doing festivals anymore, I would say that if I could recreate our festival in a different format, a much more intimate format, like I would say no more than 200 people right. in, a, in a more intimate setting and have it be like top of the line. <laughs> well, Twyla has always wanted and always and seen that she wanted a full orchestra with her. Right. That would She's be always cool. wanted that. I've always wanted you know, an orchestra. Stop, stop COVID, I, say, do it I wanted an orchestra that could, with a producer and a director that could take our music and, and write it down it. and orchestrate it. Nice. Somebody that's an expert, like if I had a lot of money, I would like that. You know, and yeah. somebody that would, you know, create that for us because we're not musicians. Yeah. We're, we're magicians. magicians. Right. We had to right. look at our music where because I I will play. All the instruments, but she will compose that atmosphere into a composition that is developing. So we said we're not we're not doing music. We're doing sorcery. We're not music right. musicians. That's why I'm saying we're saying magicians. It's journey music. Yeah, we you know for the most part. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What was where and what was the first live show you saw? 
Well, uh, God, I can't. I'll say here, you go, I'll think about it. Um, I was in San Francisco in 67. So when you say live show, that means a real yeah, production at one of the ballrooms, this Avalon Ballroom. 67, it was The Doors and a group Kaleidoscope, not the English Kaleidoscope, but the San Francisco Kaleidoscope. And I was going to see them because they had done a song called Oh Death. Mm -hmm. And they used kind of Middle Eastern. They had uh, belly dancers on each side. I walked in the auditorium and there were banners and strobe lights and people were drawing on the ground. I had my uh, Order of the Arrow Indian beads on. Mm -hmm. I asked a girl to dance and she said, hey man, if I want to dance, I just dance. So I, I, was, I, was, I was experiencing a whole new world. And then Jim Morrison comes through, uh, I didn't know at the time, touches me on the forehead and says, the wet dream of the Aztec king. And I've been doing Toltec ever there. since. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I think I recall in Israel being a young girl and going to see one of my uh, uh, favorite composers uh, just doing a piano and, and voice in a very intimate setting. Now, I, I've also skipped over the Kingston Trio, of course. You so being on some of the live albums with the Kingston Trio, like the Hungry Eye, those were actually my very first, but a very intimate, because you went to a small club where maybe there were like 20 people yeah, there. Yeah, they were a nightclub. You know, and Bill Cosby opened up with his own God. Or the they, Smothers they, Brothers. The, I went to many Smothers Brothers concerts, absolutely. Oh, wow. Uh, the Righteous Brothers, I saw. All that building up to the psychedelic time. So, um, for my very first experience, it would definitely be like the Kingston Trio. Oh, yeah. uh, where was your first performance? Well, I, I, as far as music or... Yeah, I guess. Uh, I think Tom Farrell in... Uh, San Francisco. That's where, that's where I saw her performing, and I went up on stage with a rattle and started circling her. Oh, wow. <coughs> and that's how we met. And your first was probably with the Bucket 3 at some point. Yeah, and I'm looking at all the venues. We had a little card. It said music for all occasions. Mm -hmm. So we would play a lot at hospitals. We would play a lot at a particular hospital that had uh, elderly people mm -hmm. who we then had to eat with who were drooling into their food, and I would use that material for another song when I started writing my song. So we did a lot of the you know, Lions Club, and then we branched out to the girls' high schools, oh. which were the highlight for us. So they would have the little uh, raised stool with the glasses of water, oh. and we would run up to the stage and become uh, felt stars. Yeah. Because we were all an audience Amen. of the girls. And yeah, Tom Farrell was uh, electronic, electronica, electronic music, and I added my vocals. It's sort of like I went to a few of her shows that I saw. An, an organic voice in the uh, the two of them were electronic and one bass player. And so she would do the Hate Street Fair, and I saw her in a club in Berkeley. And then uh, the time when I decided that I wanted to work with her. Um, um, that was that, at a jam, right? Yeah, that performance House jam. Yeah, was moving me. And uh, uh, that's really energetically when we decided to work together. Who is your favorite visual artist? Wow, I think Ernst Max. Max Ernst. I mean, that was just came like really quickly by that. That's been a question that has plagued that's me. And thanks big, for plaguing yeah, me again big, with that. I'll plague you again. I'll plague <laughs> you one more time. I did, I did do a book called Plagued Inside. Mm -hmm. you know, with it. But I, I've always wondered where it came from. I mean, many artists start with, you know, uh, Playboy magazine and looking at, you know, uh, Roy Neiman. Uh, Lee Roy Neiman, Alan, yeah. You know, you know, along with the Playmates. And, but... Imitating him, I would say I, I moved into Salvador Dali, which most young men will do. And I, however, I've always been searching for the person who actually, ah, it wasn't until I saw the Mesoamerican Tolteca art that wow, I, yeah. I realized that I had finally, after you know 50 years of 
wondering who I was and what my art was, that that to Piltson, who was part responsible for developing the style on vases and on murals and stuff, in now that I was him, I had finally found my inspiration. And just one more question. Who do you listen to now? Now, right now? Oh, I love Spaceman 3. Just love their, their sound. Yeah, Spaceman 3 I was really, a big I influence fell in love for this with album. Big time. Yeah, yeah. I almost like it more than anything right now. <laughs> they, they basically I don't know what it is about are them. very real. Well, they're very real. In fact, they created a wall. You found them, right? Yeah, a they're wall from, of... Um, White noise. Are they from the nineties? Uh, with their guitars, yeah, somewhere in the nineties. But they didn't try to break out of that. They kept that intention, mm -hmm. and they sing about mystical things. Even walking down the road with Jesus in the middle of white noise. Um, that that and was of good late, listening. Yeah, and of late, I, I mean, we went on a trip together with. Uh, Graham, um, my son, my oldest son, son, and we were in the car, and he started playing us all these like dark. Uh, what is it? Death. It's country? off the internet now. Death right? country or yeah. dark country? Yeah. Death country. Roots, dark country. And his selection of songs was just. We were in shock because we're not used to hearing new music now being being yep. created. I'm not saying new music. Music now being created that we like. Contemporary music. Right. I mean, we like 60s, 70s, 90s, kind of stop somewhere there, but uh, those were all as of now, right? As of like yeah, recent. Yeah, and, and he's going to send all these that, songs. It's funny he, because they took that off the. So he the tried to books. go back on the internet to find the songs and they took them out. So most of the bands that he was mentioning, as I got them, there are a lot on Spotify. Maybe we can find them. Anyways, That's probably why they're not. Really, they get paid for stuff. Do you want to mention some of the bands? I, I know, at the top of my head, I will, but I will try to. Really, add some I was. Of them. I was so. We were both so inspired and touched, and he now started the new album based on we, that inspiration. We'll work right as a, you're a collaborator. That's right. I uh, I play bass on an upcoming album Ghost coming Land. out of this uh, whole visit this time. It's it's what. Uh, Brett has been encouraging me since uh, uh, the album Wagon Wheel mm -hmm. to do because it harkens back to the Kingston Trio mm -hmm. and in a way that folk music and my life experience has evolved so now I'm the uh, more experienced darker Johnny Cash time of my life mm -hmm. and dark country everyone has a very raspy low voice well but but the sincerity is what really yeah takes it's, you, you know, I, you know, I haven't heard sincere music like that in so long. It's just like being created now. Yep. And the energy of it, the feeling it. of it, the seeing of it, it's real. It's not, it's not copying the fashion of the time. It's, it has its own energy and it's based on death. And it's really deep. Death of this core. And I finally felt that I was coming home. So for the new album, Ghostland Redux, it just took me a day to write all eight songs. Not because I had to uh, practice them in the past and I was ready, but I personally had transformed into a being that accepted that I had always been inspired from the time of the Kingston Trio, blah, 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 all the way around, all the way around to do a dark death album. And now it's on the way. Well, you and Brett encouraged me. So, Brett, can you come over and do the bass? So first we have to, uh, you know, fix the bass, which yeah. is not working. It's a kind of a death process. The bass does, is already dead. So and, and it was brought back to life. <laughs> right, exactly. So we're resurrecting at the same time as we're talking about probably the most important subject which all Orange covered with the last album, Death as an Advisor. Death is always walking by our left side and informing us on our decision making. Is this thing really that important? Is this small little tragedy 
that we're focusing on right now? Is it is it really as deep as your coming down? So all those things make our music an important thing, not just a, a, a fashion. Who's that? Gordon. Gordon, all right. Gordon. So I know where to edit. All right, so we got interrupted. Uh, yeah, you told me about some of the stuff you're listening to now, and I'm going to try to get more information out on the, this and future shows about the dark country and that upcoming album, because that, and you know, we're all kind of well, death is for everyone. What I what I hope that the album brings to the table is actually a beautiful, uplifting presentation. So it's something that when Twyla listened to it, she goes, well, those songs are really beautiful. So the content kind of starts walking in the land, in the landscape of death, but eventually it gets to a butterfly. Eventually it helps you understand how to organize or, or, or see in your life that everything will end and, and how to make the best use of your time here. Um, and that's why I call it um, Ghostland Redux, meaning revisited, because we're aware of this coming, but we actually have to be reminded of how fast it's coming. That's sort of it. And I yeah. think Dark Country gave us that feeling. That's what we were so, whoa, that's actually magic sorcery. Yeah. You know, what they're doing in a country genre is talking about the reality, and that's why Twana says very was very real, and there wasn't a lot of it was great productions, but they weren't trying; they were just doing. That's the trick, doing. And that's great artists. Those are great artists. So we we didn't know their names to share with you, but uh, they were great artists. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, sharing that, and uh, we'll play a track here now from the new album, Don Juan's Bench. And uh, yeah, next year there will be more. We'll put on those headphones, as Twyla suggested, Yep. When and go into dreaming here. We do extended tracks. We're not talking about a three-minute song for commercial radio. We're talking about eight minutes of a world here. And a few worlds. A few <laughs> worlds. And maximalism. Maximalism oh, and yeah, sound. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks again. And uh, as we fade off into the sunset and set the controls for the heart of the fun, don't go anywhere because we're going out with this sample uh, from their next album, a preliminary mix of the title track from Don Juan's Bench.